This is the ultimate vocation guide containing how to unlock every vocation, their maester skill, the best skills, augments, equipment, and tips for every single vocation together in one video for your viewing pleasure. Let's go. Now, the fighter is one of the basic vocations, so you don't have to unlock it. The fighter's role in combat is to play essentially like that tank role in melee range. You'll be keeping enemies' attention, having them attack you, and then using your unique vocation ability to block the damage that they're actually sending towards you and keeping your shield up as you're the only class that can use a shield. Now, you'll be also dishing out damage when you have those opportune moments, but protecting your allies is the key focus here. You'll play definitely a more defensive role than some of the other vocations, so it's something to think Think about if you are going to play as a fighter now you will use like that r1 block all the time right it's a very important mechanic for the fighter blocking does consume stamina and the higher damage attacks will consume more stamina when you block them but it does prevent that damage from actually going to your health you want to make sure as well that you're pointing your shield in the right direction you know you can actually change your shield direction by pressing like b or circle or whatever and then you can actually change your character's direction so that you are facing the right way because you can't really block if your shield's facing the wrong way but just be careful as well of that shield and, and stamina management because when you do have your shield up your stamina won't refresh it won't go down unless you take like a hit on the shield but you do want to make sure you're refreshing it because if you run out of stamina you're essentially a sitting duck and you will absolutely take damage but we can talk about how to keep yourself alive in a little bit but let's get into the skills right now now skill usage as a fighter isn't as often or as needed necessarily as some of the other vocations that are very skill dependent right because you're going to be using that stamina for blocking a lot as well so you'll actually be using a lot of light and heavy attacks pretty often as they don't consume stamina but there is some skills here that we will specifically call out the first skill you get like burst strike or blind strike isn't bad it's just like a, a powerful gap closer that you'll use pretty early on shield bash that turns into shield pommel is one that you absolutely should equip though now what this does is it's a powerful blow with your shield and you can knock enemies back you can knock them off cliffs what have you if they're smaller enemies it's actually really good here because because it does strike damage rather than slash. So it's really effective against things like skeletons that, you know, are resistant to slash damage. So you can actually still deal damage to them via your shield. Shield summons or shield drum is the absolute must have for pawns if you've got fighters as pawns, but not necessarily too much if you are playing as a pawn, right? Because generally speaking, the AI does have a tendency to attack you a lot of the time. So you can get away without running shield drum if you want to run something else. But essentially what this does is it pulls targets towards you, right? Which is definitely valuable to have them focus on you. Definitely valuable to have on a pawn if you've got a pawn as your fighter and watching this video for that reason, but it's, it's less important for you. You can probably tinker with something else if you did want to go that route. Airwood Slash or Cloudwood Slash is super good for the fighter as it's basically your only way to attack things in the air. Great for attacking, you know, your harpies and stuff that are flying around, but it's also really good to hit the larger enemies like in the face because, I mean, if you've got a sword, you can't really hit them in the face from hitting their toes so it allows you to sort of jump up and hit those high tags hit those weak points which can be really valuable as well it gives you that sort of flexibility you should be grabbing all the core skills here they really just advance your kit like giving you access to different abilities they don't necessarily like need to make options here true deflect isn't bad as it is like a, like the only parry in the game if you want to parry and then follow up with counter attacks without consuming stamina but really you should be grabbing all of these anyway augments is really important here now for augments right like you'll obviously grab all the fighter ones like mental to increase your physical defense, provocation, so enemies are more likely to attack you, and Thu to increase your carry weight, which is also great. You can actually grab other augments from some of the other vocations. You just have to level them up. For example, like Major's Exaltation to increase your stamina recovery speed, or the Archer's Endurance to increase your max stamina. And a lot of the Warrior augments are really good for the fighter as well, as there is a little bit of overlap in their overall kits. The fighter vocation maester you probably met just through the main story. He's Leonard in the Malv area that you probably would have come across very early. Now, you will have to return turn to Malv at a later stage to actually unlock his Maester's Teaching, which is the Righteous Fury Fighter skill, which is actually a pretty good damage skill that you can use as a bit of a finisher on some of the harder enemies as well. Now, to unlock this, you will need to complete some of the main story through Captain Brant in Venmouth. For me, this happened after I finished the Monster's Culling quest for him. I don't know if that's like a specific requirement. Let me know in the comments if it's a little different for you, but essentially what I did here is I completed that and then went to the Melv Oxcart area in Venmouth and an NPC there grabbed my attention and gave me a quest called Oxcart Courier to return to Malv and give a letter to Leonard and I went and did that and then there was actually an attack at Malv at that specific time as well which I don't think was necessarily related to the quest but it did occur so it could have been that it could have been this quest I just want to call it out but 
I won't show too much just for like spoilers and stuff. But, you know, essentially after you've done that, you'll be able to get the Righteous Fury skill book from him called Soldier's Code. You'll just need to then use it in your inventory and then you've unlocked it for both you and your main pawn as well. And yeah, I don't know the very specific requirements for this event to occur, but that's how it occurred for me. It may be a little different for you. Definitely put that down in the comments if like something happened a little bit different for you. So the like specific event triggers we haven't really worked out yet. We're not, you know, further enough in the game's development to know yet. But gear wise, you always want to be on the hunt for better gear, either by buying it from vendors, finding it in the world. Make sure you are upgrading it, especially your armor to increase overall defense, but also lower its weight slightly as fighter gear is very heavy. An important detail for fighters as well is that you can use both maces and swords. I would recommend to use swords because they are like a slash weapon. And then because you've got your shield, which is a strike weapon, then you could do both slash and strike damage. So you're covering both of the damage types there. Whereas a mace, you're just doing strike, which isn't bad, but then you're not actually hitting slash if they are, you know, resistant to strike. So you've got the variation there. Armor is very important for the fighter and having a high defense. So make sure you are investing in your armor and upgrading it and, you know, actually purchasing any of the better armor equipment that you can get. And the same goes for your rings, right? Like the rings that improve your overall defenses, like increase your HP or reduce the amount of damage you take. Those things are definitely valuable to have as a fighter. A couple of tips here for playing as the fighter. Now, larger characters is actually a good idea for the fighter because you can carry more weight the larger you are. And because you're going to be wearing heavier armor, it just helps a little bit better. Like if you're a small fighter and wearing like super heavy armor, you're going to pick up stuff all the time that you're just going to get over encumbered so quickly. It does help with that. Plus, if you're larger, you're more resistant to being knocked down as well. Having a support mage with your fighter, say if you are playing as the fighter, you've got a support mage as your main pawn or a summon pawn is really valuable to have to heal you, to remove any status effects that you get hit with as you do want everything to be attacking you. So you will be taking damage. You will get knocked down. You'll have to get back up again. And having a, a pawn there can really help you if they're supporting you in that way. But the overall focus here for the fighter really is to use shield drum, have things attack you and then fight them back right now. If you are fighting things that like skeletons and things that are resistant to slash, you've got your shield there to deal that extra damage in that way. And then you've got other, you know, your allies that are really going to be doing the brunt of the damage here. Like you can easily get away with having three ranged allies and just having you as the only melee character and just try and have everything focus fire you and then having them just dump all that damage into you and, and around you because you've got everything attacking you. It does make that a little bit easier. And it's it's probably the main focus of this play style, right? You can go a little bit more like offensive focus with some of the skills that we didn't mention here, but that you're if you're going that route, you're probably better off than evolving into the warrior as that's a bit more of the warrior's focus is on those more heavy hitting attacks that are a bit more damage focused that you can do some of the support stuff. But the fighter really is that tanking specific vocation. You'll get a lot of success out of that if you want to go down that route and being that survivability brunt that's going to be on the front lines. So the Archer is unlocked automatically and it's a ranged DPS dealer that you're really going to be sitting in the back line, hopefully avoiding taking damage so that you can just pummel enemies with arrows. The Archer can do a pretty insane amount of damage with just their basic normal attacks, like specifically using Steady Shot. The default light attack is pretty average. It does auto target enemies, which is really the only reason why you want to use it. But for the most part, you want to be using Steady Shot so you can actually aim your targets through them that over the shoulder effect and it does increase the damage that all of your skills do when you are using steady shot as you can use all of your skills with steady shot and sometimes you'll actually notice as well a skill might be pretty average just in like the normal skill but it's actually pretty good in steady shot and why the archer really works is because of steady shot right you're going to hear that a lot in this video because you can basically always hit the weak points on enemies now you'll actually hear a specific sound when you are hitting the weak point it's a little different like the hit sound when you're hitting weak points compared to when you're not. Essentially, always aim for this, right? It's one of the core parts of what makes the archer so good is because you can hit those points at any time very easily than some of the other classes, like the melee classes that might need to climb enemies or specifically aim their shots in certain ways. You can just put your reticule on the weak point and shoot away. Now, the thing as well to point out here is that steady shot doesn't consume stamina by default, just using the normal arrows. Obviously, skills does, but stamina isn't as important with the archer 
archer vocation as some of the others, right? Like you can really get away with not necessarily worrying too much about your stamina as for the most part, the basic trash enemies, you don't really need to use your skills much just because of the overall damage it does, especially when you use certain rings and setups, but the skills are obviously worthwhile. And speaking of those skills, Deathly Arrow or Dire Arrow fires a devastating shot that knocks back smaller targets. You can use this to knock enemies off cliffs or just like stun them, knock them down, that sort of thing. Really great, like damage ability really good against larger enemies too if you can hit those weak points to sort of stagger them a bit as well i'm a really big fan of the specific arrow shots as well like exploding tiring and drenching shots specifically here exploding is definitely the best option if you can use that because not only does it do a ton of damage when you hit the weak spot but it does stagger enemies you can very easily knock enemies over by exploding arrows into their weak spots Manifold shot or barrage shot does fire arrows in a rapid succession, allowing you to sort of burst damage enemies. You can use this while moving as well. And I did use this heaps. I did really like this, but I ended up actually switching to torrent shot, which like you kneel down and you will be able to spam arrows in very rapid succession until you essentially run out of stamina. You can keep using the follow-up attack with this. I actually switched to torrent shot because I found that I only really used barrage shot or used that when say I knocked enemies down i really wanted to like burst them into their weak spots whereas torrent shot allows you to do that exact thing it just lowers your field of view because you can't actually pivot because you've knelt down right so you if they move out of your line of fire you'll have to stand up again but torrent shot i actually really enjoyed for your core skills you obviously want to get them all but swift knock is one to call out here as it allows you to knock arrows more quickly so you can lose them faster which definitely as soon as that pops up you want to grab swift knock but obviously grab them all for your augments again like they're all pretty solid and you scan to increase damage dealt by your attacks when targets are not in combat is really good especially if you want to line this up with say a deathly arrow like start combat that way you'll deal extra damage endurance to increase your max stamina is obviously great and lethality to increase damage when striking a target's vital so their weak spots obviously we know why that's good major's exaltation is one you can grab to increase your stamina recovery speed the thief's um, decrease to the likelihood of being targeted by foes isn't bad either so you can definitely grab that so then targets don't focus you definitely good there and the magic archer also has some great augments for the archer as well the vocation maester is talazan who is an elf in the sacred arbor now in order to unlock the vocation maester skill called heavenly shot you will need to do a couple of quests it's a little bit longer than some of the other vocations especially the basic ones essentially here you'll need to run into gwendia in venworth and after talking to him you'll start his first quest gift of the bow which which you should do anyway because you do get a really good ring out of it but out of that essentially you'll then need to go and do the trial of the archery which is his next quest and then once you've completed that talazan will then give you the heavenly shot however for me i didn't actually get it straight away i needed to level up my archer vocation more i think you need to like rank six ish seemingly once i hit that he actually sought me out when i was just in arbor like he just came up to me and was like hey have this skill so yeah you might want to just pay attention to that but yeah go and do those quests in arbor and then you'll eventually be able to get this. Also, if you like what we do here, consider hitting that like button or subscribing or the membership program for just one dollar, you can get early access to videos like this and all of my other guides, build videos and those cheeky long form essays we do. Plus there are other benefits like members only channels in the Discord, merch and more. So if you like what we do here, please consider hitting that join button or subscribing as it helps me more than you know. But enough of that, back to the video. The skill, however, isn't great. Like Heavenly Shot, what it does is it's, it's, it's sort of like a souped up Deathly Arrow but it does consume all of your stamina. Now, before it even shoots, you have to consume your entire stamina bar and then it'll shoot. Now, one, if you miss that arrow, you've wasted your entire stamina bar and you've done nothing while you've just been standing there like building up this shot. And two, because it consumes your entire stamina bar, even afterwards, you're going to stand there as a sitting dark and like recover your stamina for a little bit before you can shoot again. Deathly arrow is probably just better to use in general, right? Like it doesn't do as much damage, but it, it accomplishes a very similar effect of having that like one arrow that does a significant amount of like burst and like stagger damage 
range. So I'd really just stick with that. But if you want to use Heavenly Shot, then you absolutely can. Equipment for the Archer. Now you can actually get a really good bow from that same quest line we just talked about with the Maester. When you complete the Trial of Archery, you'll get the Elven Repeller bow, which is quite good. And you can then go back to Venworth and upgrade this bad boy, which you really should be doing, right? Armor's not super important for the Archer, right? Because you don't really want to take damage. The main thing here is just upgrading your bow, making sure you've got a ton of burst potential with it and damage potential with it. And you'll have great success with that. For your rings, the Ring of Proximity is really like all you need here. Now, this just strengthens the bow attacks when you are closer to your enemies. So the closer you are, the more damage it will do. Now, you'll get one of these from completing the Gift of the Bow quest and you can get others throughout the game as well. But the ring that reduces your likelihood to be staggered or knocked back is also not bad as well. So it helps you just sort of stay in the fight if anything does sort of attack you. A couple of tips for playing this build. Use the to me command for your pawns so that they come and save you if enemies are attacking you. It'll just help get the enemies off you. I mentioned it earlier, but use steady shot literally all the time. It just increases your damage by so much. You can target all the weak points. It's really the main crux of this build and archers in general is just using steady shot. Now, I mentioned the exploding shot earlier and how good that is you obviously need to craft the arrows in order to actually use this or just buy them so if you do have the recipes to do it you need sun bloom arrows and the stick item i forget what the name is but you need those to just be able to craft them and then you can craft them the other arrow types as well but if you have run out of those specific arrows obviously you can't use the skill if you just go to a campsite you can then actually just like change that arrow skill you have active to one of the ones that you've still actually got arrows of in your inventory so it saves you that sort of having to go back to you know up to the city and then switch out your skills in that way you should also have a mage with you here at pretty much all times to imbue your arrows with status effects because there isn't really a way you could do it as an archer so having a mage that can add lightning and fire etc to your arrows really valuable here to get you that extra bit of status effect as you don't have a lot of flexibility in terms of your status effect usage as an archer or even using say strike or slash damage so having a mage imbue your weapons can definitely help there also the kick that you can do with like triangle you won't really use heaps because you don't want enemies to be attacking you. You don't want to be that close to enemies. You only really use it to like look cool sometimes in some cinematic shots or if anything's do get close to you. The thief is unlocked automatically and if you're typically a dexterity based class player in other RPGs, it's probably the one that you're going to lean most towards because of their nimble kit and quick attacks. They also have a higher stamina and they can't really take much of a punch, which isn't really their main focus. Like they will be on the front line, but essentially from behind enemies or not necessarily taking the main brunt of the damage and using the dodge button that they do have as I believe they are the only class that has as a dodge being swift step here which is you know perfect for the souls like fans out there but essentially you can use that mechanic to avoid damage that's coming towards you and then follow up with very fast attack combos and grabbing onto enemies and stabbing them in the face and doing all that good stuff and since you can't really take much of a hit here as well like you will want to try and avoid that damage either by having a fighter take that damage or just like dodging as already mentioned and then you've got other ways like obviously if you're grabbing onto enemies as well like if you're on their back it's a harder for them to hit you which can definitely help you avoid some of that damage but it's just an important thing to think about here as the thief really is that you'll be avoiding damage and dealing damage quickly back to enemies and you can avoid it in different ways and then also just worry about your stamina management here as you will be spamming a lot of skills as a thief so you just want to make sure you are allowing that stamina time to regen because there are some really amazing skills that the thief does have and speaking of those skills we'll start with ensnare now this is like a grappling hook skill that you you will definitely be using throughout pretty much the whole game as a thief. Now, what this allows you to do is pull smaller enemies towards you and it allows you to trip larger enemies, like have them like lose their balance and fall over. Now, if you can trigger this right when you start encounters, it makes it much easier to like say in a goblin fight, you can pull goblins towards you, then use your twin fangs attack to do massive damage while they're knocked down. And then there's also the only vacation that can bring flying enemies to the ground in this way as well as you can pull the harpies down so it helps with that as well being that you are a melee class it allows you to actually hit those enemies and bring them down with a bit of force as well 
Enkindled Blades is another great skill to get as it lets you imbue your daggers with flame damage so you can get that extra bit of status damage off as well, which will help build that burning damage onto enemies and especially for enemies that are weak to burning, it's really valuable to have so you can actually get the value there. This later scales into Ignited Blades, which makes it a little bit longer lasting. So you definitely want to just grab this to give you that extra bit of damage as for the most part, other than this and a couple of other solutions here, you will only really be doing that slash damage. It just gives you a bit more variation. Concussive Step is one that, I've got to be honest, it's not really all that great, but for combat, this is a skill that's really helpful for a little bit of like platforming as you can use it to get up onto locations, right? So this skill is essentially like a double jump that you can also use to stun enemies when you activate it. And believe it or not, this game really wants you to play as Mario or Sonic in certain places. And there's also certain chests that this skill makes easier to get to, especially in the first city. And the one thing I will say though is that it won't break your fall if you're falling from a great height so you won't be able to torrent double jump this skill unfortunately but this is also scales and becomes the concussive leaf which makes your jump much higher and then so obviously you can still continue to use this as a movement ability but it does cause more stun now after these it's kind of a little bit up to you as what you want to use for that additional weapon slot you could use the vocation maester skills which we'll talk about shortly but you've also got some other options here as well like you've got the starting skill dividing wind which is really good it does fit pretty well with this class and like if you want to stick with it like it's basically makes you dash while you're doing a flurry of blows to the enemy it's like pretty good but you know if you want something that's more of a specific use case for for what i was doing i didn't really end up using it that much this also scales into cutting wind which essentially just gives you more range for the skill powdered charge for this slot as it's basically just a free explosion to put on enemies feet to set and then forget while you can scale this into powder blast to have a bit more of an area effect as well helm split I was definitely sleeping on originally. So this skill, you leap in the air and like do the sonic spin animation essentially. And like I originally thought this wasn't that good because like you often will miss smaller enemies. But the thing is, if you save this for bosses, it's absolutely incredible, especially when you're buffed with various ways. So it's a really good skill that I would definitely be putting on your bar. Ultimately, it's really up to your playstyle, what you like for that other extra slot. Really, those first three are the main ones that I would grab. For your course, skills here you just grab all of them right like they're they're a must anyway they essentially just make your overall kit more important the main one you want to grab here is controlled fall now what this does is it gives you a chance to avoid taking large amounts of damage when you fall this is really important as we talked about in the opener that you can sort of climb every big beast and you can then you know stab them and then if you're falling off them you can avoid some of that damage as well augments are just as important and you won't have heaps of these early on but there is a bunch of good ones gratification gives you a slight amount of health back when you deliver the killing blow on an enemy and poise reduces the amount of stamina that you use while you're struggling on an enemy's grip like holding onto them now you can use augments from other vocations which you should be doing because you can level them up and then equip them one of the good ones here is like major's exaltation to increase your stamina recovery speed fighters metal to increase your physical defense if you do take damage or like warriors vitality here as well to increase your maximum hp even the archers endurance is good as well to give you more stamina to the vocation maester for the thief is located in the nameless village off to the northeast of Vernworth. He's at the top of the hill in the old noble manor. If you want to talk to him, he'll give you the legend's opus, which will teach you the blades of pyre skill. Now, this skill will ignite your daggers and cause an explosion, which affects enemies around you, but it also burns you too. Now, this is kind of a spoiler, so I'm going to be pretty vague here, but he's not the only vocation maester for this vocation. There is another one that is actually basically at the same location. You will just need to go down a certain ladder and follow through some trials. You'll find another maester that will give you the Pilferer's Handbook, which will teach you the Formless Faint skill, which allows you to react in an accelerated rate, letting you avoid enemy attacks and get behind enemies much quicker. Really great skill to use. Also, side note, as you're leaving this area, if you go to the door on the left of the Thief Maester, there's a bunch of chests in that room with some pretty decent Thief gear and materials for crafting. Speaking of that gear, wow, this transition worked so perfectly. So gear is obviously important. You'll be finding it in the world and buying it from vendors. The one thing you 
want to make sure you upgrade for the thief is your daggers because you are primarily a damage dealer you're not necessarily going to be taking damage so you want to make sure you're dealing as much damage as possible you could probably wait until venworth before worrying too much about sinking too much gold into any of your armor or or your gear really because you will find gear out in the world and you don't necessarily want to waste all that gold upgrading sort of the basic stuff that you do get now once you do get to that nameless village there is like that really good thief gear that i mentioned here if you are wondering what you can sort of use or what i'm using here you can use the pent layers for your weapons which is found next to that maester as well as the rampant breaker for your chest which is found in the nameless village shop and also the thief gators which is found in a chest there as well and if you're looking at say like rings which are also important the ring of exaltation will give you a little bit of extra health it's a pretty common ring and then i also like the ring of vehemence here as well so you can increase your likelihood of staggering and knocking down enemies so then you can stab them in the face while they're on the ground now seeker tokens are something you'll come across throughout the game as well and you'll get the ring of vehemence by handing in five seeker tokens to a vocation shop actually if you get 30 seeker tokens there is the dowsing spikes daggers as well which you can grab which is a unique dagger you can get from handing those in too a couple of vocation tips for the thief to finish us off here you want to keep yourself roughly in lightweight here for the faster stamina regen and movement so having sort of a pack mule pawn is really great for a thief so you can keep that lighter movement the thief is really good at climbing literally everything you've got augments to buff that whole time as well as to help you if you do fall off and you can then focus on those weak points right you can climb those enemies find those weak points and then listen for that specific sound effect as it is slightly different when you are hitting weak points and then you'll be able to deal even more damage that way you definitely want to have a mage in your party here as well to imbue your weapons with those various status effects and you can obviously do it with the enkindled blades but if you've got a mage you can then switch that skill out for something else so the mage itself is unlocked automatically and it is a backline support healer for the most part, but you can do some really solid damage with some of its damage orientated spells, but really their primary role is support, right? You'll either be buffing your allies by imbuing their weapons with elemental damage, healing them directly or adding other effects to them. The heavy attack for the mage is an AOE heal that will linger for a few seconds. Now you should actually pop this on your melee characters, like don't just pop it on yourself as they will essentially just like run over to you to heal themselves when they need it, which can get a little bit tricky in tougher fights. So just make sure you put that away from where you're planning to stand. The other unique ability for the mage is actually shared with the sorcerer and that is quick spell. So essentially a core component of the mage's kit is building up these skills and casting these spells, right? And that does take time. Now with quick spell by pressing R1 or RB, you can increase the speed that these spells actually cast. So they cast much quicker. You'll essentially always want to do this although it does consume more stamina and stamina management is one of the hardest things for the mage as you very quickly run out as even if you've got stamina left you can then actually cast the spell and it'll consume the stamina needed to actually cast that spell and it'll just put you down to zero so you've got to be really careful about your stamina management as a mage as you will be very stamina hungry but there are ways that we can mitigate that which we'll discuss in this video so let's talk about the skills and augments here now th there's a couple of things really to think about the mage has a lot of flexibility here we'll start with some damage stuff you have a couple of options here really from flagration to leaven and frigo as well as empyrean but i would suggest to you to run either leaven or frigo because flagration is sort of like flamethrower hands you have to be close to an enemy which you don't really want to be as a mage i personally like leaven because it's like a spammable lightning right you can continue to cast this and consume your stammer and just like spam it and especially if you knock over the larger enemies you can just pop this on them and just consume your entire stamina bar spamming this on them Frigor is a really good stagger as well, like definitely worth using. You can sort of climb it as well. Now, Empyrean is really unique for the mage. It's one of the only holy attacks in the game, and it is exceptional at destroying the night creatures. So I really highly recommend running this on your mage because, you know, some of those night creatures can be a little tricky and it will like absolutely melt them. It's really good for that. Now, you've also got some of the ally healing spells, right? You can use spells here that will remove status effects from your allies or Argent Tonic that will 
will just heal allies as well, or Celeratory, which will increase their speed for allies that are actually standing within its circle. Celeratory isn't great because it is sort of a small AoE. The Argon Tonic, you'll definitely want to run to heal allies. Is It's really important to do that. But you'll also be looking to grab at least one, maybe two of the boons from the Fire, Ice, and Lightning. Now, all of these are good. It is really up to you which ones you want to run. Lightning is great for wet weather and same as ice, right? You increase the effectiveness of those during wet weather. Obviously, fire doesn't. And enemies have certain weaknesses. You can listen to your pawns as they'll often tell you what the enemy's weakness is. So it is good to have different damage types on your mage from these different types. So you can then be using the relevant type for these. Now, if you are thinking of playing the mage yourself, you should probably run one to two damage and then the rest being support spells, right? Having that good balance. Now, if your pawn is actually your mage, if you're watching this thinking about what to do with your pawn, I would be running all support for your pawn with Empyrean because of its uniqueness, right? So you'd be running, let's say, two of the boons from, let's say, Ice and Lightning, Empyrean, and then probably the Argentonic as like the heal there, right? So you've got that balance as the support focus is really the key thing aspect of the mage and that's why you would run them as a main pawn but also for yourself right if you're playing them it can be a little bit like i don't want to say boring but like just constantly buffing your allies doesn't give me the satisfactory juices in combat if you know what i mean so that's why i prefer to run a couple of damage spells for my mage so i can actually deal some some impact to the enemies for your core skills here you'll obviously grab all of these the main one being quick spell which we touched on earlier you'll essentially use this all the time except when you are running low on stamina so just make sure you are keeping an eye on your stamina levitate is just as good too because you can essentially allow yourself to like levitate for a period of time you can use this to climb things your allies will also do this like pawns can also use it as well it is very valuable to get to certain areas to unlock certain hidden chests for the augments here there's a couple of good ones but like that none of them are super critical like beatitude increases the amount of healing you do for curatives and curative magics perpetuation increases the duration of enchantments and invigorations so that being like your elemental infusions exaltation for your stamina recovery speed is absolutely fantastic because we've already talked about why stamina is important and that's also why the archer's endurance is important to increase your overall max stamina and you could also run thief subtlety to reduce the chance of being attacked by enemies as well as you essentially don't want to be attacked as a mage right it definitely helps for that the vocation maester here is a really annoying one i'll be honest so eni's home is the vocation maester and they're sort of northwest of the border watch outpost now you will need to talk to them when their parents aren't around the first time you go there there'll be a cutscene. you'll sort of have to either wait for them to leave or like carry them outside or something and then she'll tell you about this quest to find th five grimoires now you only actually Actually need to find three and they're very specific grimmars there are multiple copies of all five of them in the game so you may already have some anyway but what I'll do is I'll tell you where you can get three of them very easily the first is actually in the checkpoint rest town from her father at the very top of the rest town he does have a house there now you need to be careful about sneaking in here you can use your level levitate to sneak in up the top and sitting on the table there is one of these books you can get another one from actually in the main crest from the magistrate when you talk to him in the cell he you talk to him again after he tells you he's looking for a bookstore he'll actually give you one of these and the last one you can get in Mel by talking to the vendor that actually stands near the entrance if you talk to him he actually has one of these books for sale now before you go back to any you need to create forgeries of these three books because you will need them for the sorcerer's maester training as well so before you do that go back to the checkpoint rest town or if you're already there go to the scrap store and create forgeries of the three books now make sure you pay attention to the names here as they will change and the description will say if it's the forgery or the real one you need to give the real ones to any back at her house near border watch so head back there if her parents are there again or sorry grandparents you just pick them up carry them outside and then you can give her the three books and she'll then ask you she'll be like oh do you want to collect the rest you just say nope i do not want to do that and then she'll complete the quest and then you'll need to leave and like past time now for me i just went out to the campfire slept a couple of days just be mindful this area is littered with enemies so you'll probably be attacked and raided if you do sleep here but essentially after that point an event will trigger and avoiding spoilers in case you don't want them you'll need to save her by tackling her 
during that event, right? Don't kill her and then she'll need to rest again and then you'll need to go and rest yourself and then return there again and she will then give you the maester training. It's a little bit complex and I've tried to avoid as much spoilers as possible, but essentially that's all the main information you need to know in order to be able to unlock this maester training. Now this does give you the celestial PN skill and this summons a wave of holy light that both hastens the stamina recovery and the speed of allies who touch it while reducing their damage taken. Really, really good support skill, except it has a really long, like, wind up time in order to be able to use it. So essentially here, it is worth having, especially on a main pawn because of the benefits you get. Like, let's say, you know, you are, let's say you're playing as a fighter or a warrior, what have you, you're using a bunch of stamina, having this active will then obviously buff them and reduce the damage taken. But you yourself, I wouldn't necessarily recommend running it because it does have such a long wind up time. The best equipment here for the mage, really like you will get a really good stuff from this quest. And and other than that, I would be going to Arbor, the Elven Village, as there is a bunch of good weapons and armor for mages and sorcerers here. You should be upgrading them in Arbor as well because you get additional magic on top of that. So definitely go there and do that. For your rings, you want the Ring of Precipitous to boost your magic and the Ring of Articulatlancy to slightly reduce the time taken to enchant spells. So it sort of like works as essentially a mini quick spell. A couple of quick tips here. You need to have at least a one melee fighter or warrior in your party to protect you preferably two melee characters to keep the pressure off you. If things are pressuring you, using the two me command can really help get them away from you. You should also be carrying some stamina food here for the instant stamina regen. When you do run out or you're close to running out, you can quickly pop that to heal your stamina back up very quickly. I'd also say here that if you prefer the like the mage sort of play style, but you want to damage rather than support, definitely switch to the sorcerer, right? There is some overlap in their skills. Also like using the augments from from each of these will be beneficial, right? So having both leveled up is definitely a good idea, but if you prefer the more damage focus, definitely go Sorcerer, but if you like the support aspects of the mage, then stay the mage. All right, so how you unlock the Sorcerer, you will probably may have already done it, but in case you haven't, it happens very early in the game in Venworth. If you talk to the Vocation Guild leader there, he'll actually give you the quest. You'll just need to head over to the mines that he points you to the direction of. There's a chest in there that contains a staff. You'll just need to return that to him or give him any other staff of the Sorcerer and you will have unlocked it. So where the mage is a backline healer, the Sorcerer is really like a backline magic damage dealer. The Sorcerer excels at high stamina usage spells with a long wind up time that devastate enemies. Their triangle skill is why they excel at this and what Galvanizer does is it refreshes your stamina very quickly and because that you can essentially do this and also use your quick spell to dump all of your stamina into getting spells off more quickly, you got a really nice flow to getting these damage spells off compared to a mage that you know, you'd need to be a little bit more careful with your stamina management, use some more stamina like healing items here and there, but as a a sorcerer, you don't necessarily need to because you can regen your stamina yourself. It, it, there is really like an excellent progression between like starting out as a mage with the spells and mechanics there and then moving into the sorcerer if you want to focus more on damage. The specifically AoE damage, like most of the spells for the sorcerer are AoE focused. You'll need to aim some of them by actually just lining them up. Some of them will actually like self target like a lot of the spells do, but there is a lot of flexibility in terms of the different elemental types of damage you are doing here and because you remove the not restrictions but like the the extra flexibility that the mage has in terms of you know support spells etc this allows you to have one spell of each of the different elemental types active on yourself as a sorcerer plus then the maester skill which is just absolutely cracked there's actually two maester skills we'll cover both of them in this video but the meteoron is just insane like the meteor shower it does is just it does so much damage but we'll cover that in a little bit all right skills first thundermine is probably my favorite skill especially once you've upgraded this. Now, this conjures a ball of lightning that will essentially stand in front of you. It does knock back smaller enemies, and it's great to pop this at the start of combat when you're building up to, say, use one of these, like, longer cast time spells because they will protect you, those, like, thunder cracks as they'll, like, knock enemies back, and it's just a good damage spell to do for, like, thunder damage anyway. Sizium is really good too. I wasn't sure 
sure about this at first, but it actually is really good. Like the physical damage it does, like knocking enemies in the air is really good. And it's also great because a lot of the sorcerer's spells are magic based. This is physical based. So if they are resistant to magic damage, you've got that option as well. Hargle is a bone chilling blizzard in the immediate vicinity. And it, it's, it triggers frostbite, which is probably the main reason you'll use it, especially on groups of enemies. Really good AOE to use this on groups of smaller enemies, even larger enemies if you can freeze them as well. Decanter, I'm a little bit hit and miss with. Now, Decanter, I originally started using it and essentially what this does is it heals you, like it saps the health from the target to heal you and damage them. At first, I was like, yeah, this, is, this isn't bad. Like, it does self-target, so like you can just sort of hold the spell as long as you like as well, and it doesn't consume any more stamina, but its damage is very hit and miss depending on resistances seemingly. So it's it's a good option to run if say you're not running a mage healer or something, but I wouldn't be running it otherwise. For your core skills here, you want to grab all the core skills. The main one being quick spell, we've already touched on why that's great. Even it's exactly the same as the, the mage here because it hastens your incantation speed. Now the benefit here is that if you do consume all your stamina as a sorcerer, you can quickly heal it back with galvanize to actually get that stamina back i actually use this while running around too actually as a sorcerer and levitate is obviously great so you can float around climb things get to these chests that are sometimes tricky to get to for your augments you will essentially grab all the sorcerer ones they're all pretty solid the mage exaltation to augment your stamina's recovery speed archer's endurance to increase your max stamina and thief's subtlety to reduce the chance of being attacked by foes are all fantastic for a sorcerer the vocation Maester. Now there's actually two and the quest line kind of starts the same as the mage. Now if you watched my mage video I did cover the other half of this as both the mage and the sorcerer maesters quests are technically linked. So watch the mage one if you want the mage stuff but for this one we're going to focus on Mirden which is the sorcerer maester and you will need to actually complete Trisha's quest as well to get the other maester skill. So we'll start with that. Now Ina's home is located to the northwest of the border watch outpost and you need to go here and start her quest when you get here there'll be a little cutscene that'll play you'll need to wait for her grandparents to leave you can either pick them up and carry them outside or just like wait for that to happen you know just like pastime etc once that has occurred she'll give you a quest where she's looking for grimoires now she wants five but you'll need to bring her three now if you go to the checkpoint rest town at the very top here you'll find Mirden's home when you arrive here he will walk outside and be like man you don't look cool and he'll like walk back inside you need to put on the courtly tunic and breeches for him to consider you important enough to talk to him. Once you have done that, he will then come out. He'll see you again. He'll drag you inside. He'll give you his half of the quest. You'll need to do both of these quests. And his quest is exactly the same, right? He wants five grimoires. And again, you only need to give him three. Now, these grimoires, there are multiple copies of them throughout the game of all of these. So technically, you can do it a different way and just like go out and find them. However, if you just want to find three of them and complete both of these quests, what you need to do is go back out Mirrodin's house and then climb up the rocks on the outside and jump across into the balcony and on the top here you'll find the first one of these grimoires now just grab this and then immediately leave the house do not go downstairs as he gets real mad if he finds out you snuck into his house so after you've left here you want to head to Vernworth and you may have already done this but the magistrate when he is hiding in the cell when he's locked up if you have done that quest or talk to him if you speak to him again he'll actually give you one of the grimoires that these people are looking for and then now you've got two and then you can grab a third one very easily in Melv from the vendor there. You just talk to him. He'll actually have the Fluminous Shield for sale and you can just grab that. And now you've got three. Now, because there's two of them and they both want three, what you'll need to do is actually make counterfeits. So if you go back to the checkpoint rest town and talk to the forgery guy at the scrap shop, you'll be able to make forgeries of all three of these. Now the forgeries, the three forgeries that you create after resting so that you can wait the valid time in order to be able to get them, you can then just give all three of these to Mirden. Now, he'll then ask if you want to collect the other five. You just say no, and he'll then complete the quest, and you'll be able to get his maester skill, which is the Maelstrom, which is a massive whirlwind attack that wreaks havoc on the ground. Now, this does have a huge wind-up time, and you can't speed it up with quick spell. It is really good to cast sort of when there's a lot of enemies that are grouped together, and it does deal a decent amount of damage. It's just hard to actually trigger the effect consistently because enemies will 
often sort of move out of its space. It happens a lot with some of these like AOE spells. The best one actually comes from Trisha. Now, if you've still got the three like real grimoires, make sure you don't actually give the real ones to Mid and take the real ones to Trisha. And then she'll do the same thing. She'll say, you want to collect more? You say no. And then you'll actually have to leave there and go and rest at like the campsite or just like leave, come back later, etc. Another scene will play out and to avoid any spoilers here, all you need to do is tackle her. Don't kill her, just tackle her to the ground. Then you'll need to wait for her to rest and by leaving and coming back again. And then once you've done that, she'll give you the Meteoron Maester skill, which is absolutely cracked. This summons a Meteor Shower that does an immense amount of damage in a massive range. It will kill all of like your little smaller enemies basically in one shot. It does an insane amount of damage to the larger like bosses that you'll find throughout the world, especially in Vernworth and even once you get into Batal and beyond. But it is fantastic. Like the Meteoron is a absolutely crack spell that I, I've been using heaps. Now it does have a long wind up time, but if you use those other spells like using the Thunder Mind to sort of use that first, give you a little bit of protection and then just like stand there and wait for this to go off. It, the, the cast time is really long, but the actual damage it does is so worth it so i highly recommend using this for best equipment for the sorcerer arbor is the place you want to go there's some great weapons and armor for both mages and sorcerers here but there is actually i think one of the best staffs here in just like the arbor armory shop for some reason like the lion's lord archie staff it is super expensive but if you've got that money like it's magic damage here is just insane for the fact that you could just buy this in Vanworth very early in the game so i highly recommend saving up for that if you are going for the sorcerer route otherwise you know just any equipment that you can get and obviously upgrade your equipment at arbor because it does do more magic increase for any upgrades that you do do there the ring of articulancy is definitely a good one to run to slightly reduce the time taken to encant spells otherwise any ring that boosts your magic or i'm using the ring of triumph here to boost my max stamina my max carry weight and my max health but really it's up to you as long as you've got the articulacy ring on you should be fine a couple of tips to close this out here use level outside combat to access chest and inside combat to reposition so you don't take damage from things that are attacking you you can sort of climb away from them you need at least one melee fighter or warrior in your party preferably two to keep the pressure off you the two me command can be super valuable for that as well so that you can use that to have them come and protect you and i said this in my mage guide but carrying stamina food is really relevant here because you can instantly refresh your stamina if you do run out but it's less important as a sorcerer because you've got galvanized it's just in case you sort of you're about to like immediately run out also if you like what we do here consider hitting that like button or subscribing or the membership program for just one dollar you can get early access to videos like this and all of my other guides build videos and those cheeky long form essays we do plus there are other benefits like members only channels in the discord merch and more so if you like what we do here please consider hitting that join button or subscribing as it helps me more than you know but enough of that back to the video Unlocking this vocation is pretty easy, so we won't spend too much time on it. You essentially arrive at Venworth, speak to the vocation guild leader. He'll start the quest. Essentially, then you just need to give him a sword. And the easiest way to do that is to follow the quest line and go to the mine, pick up the sword from the chest, and then return it to him, and you'll unlock the vocation. So the playstyle for the warrior is a little different to the fighter, but there is some similarities. Now, the main difference here is obviously the two-handed weapon compared to the sword and shield, but also the fact that this is a very small slow heavy hitting class now you're focused on dealing a lot of damage with high impact attacks and staggering enemies knocking them back but at a very very slow rate it's less of a tank than the fighter is but you can still taunt enemies as well as dish out and insane amounts of damage because of that now there are ways that you can mitigate its slow animations one of them is by comboing barge with your light attacks it will essentially like animation cancel the end of the light attack combo as you can sort of swing and then barge and then swing and then barge the other is one of the augments chain of blows that once you have unlocked this you can time your swings together to reduce the amount of like wind up time by like timing your attacks rather than button mashing there's a couple of other things that you really need to know about this class like it's you really need to rely on consistent damage as missing your attacks really sucks like <laughs> because you've got such a slow effect and a lot of the animations are sort of designed for you to actually be hitting these targets now if you hold square to like
like wind up your normal attacks or even some of your skills actually you can do this with as well you'll do like a charged attack that obviously does more damage so you can then even deal even more damage with the already hard hitting attacks and relying on those hard hitting consistent attacks with the warrior is really the main focus here so speaking of skills here we'll get into some skills and the rending sweep is pretty typical and you'll run this basically you spin the blades with enough force to cut down foes in all directions and this can be charged prior as well so speaking of that charge now it's a really good skill to deal aoe damage to everything around you i'm also a fan of skyward sunder so you can jump up in the air and slash enemies down very similar to the fighters version of this good aerial attack like it helps you hit enemies say in the head if they are weak in the head and you need to jump up to the bigger enemies or pull down harpies that sort of thing bellow is a shout to draw attention of enemies it's essentially a taunt to pull enemies towards you and i also think null breaker is a good one here this thrust the blade upwards dealing a solid blow that can knock targets off balance and render them unconscious knocking them off balance like having them fall over is the main focus here because with the heavy attack if you do like a jump heavy attack or just like a heavy attack on an enemy that is like staggered on the ground you'll do like a unique animation where you'll sort of like pick them up with the weapon and like slam them back down and then like throw them so a way to like trigger this effect more regularly is why null breaker is good here for your core skills obviously you want to grab all of these but i did mention chain of blows earlier and learning the timings of that once you have unlocked it will really level up your warrior gameplay as before you get that and until you sort of get going with the warrior it can be a really difficult class to sort of master and feel impactful but this does definitely make a difference for augments here grab all the warrior ones the fighter metal to increase your physical defense as well as fighter provocation so enemies are more likely to attack you are both good here major's exaltation to increase your stamina recovery speed and archer's endurance to increase your max stamina aren't bad either if you want to go those routes the vocation maester for the warrior is a tricky one now this is a beast ridden named baron and he can be found in baron's tent just north of melv you'll need to talk to him to start a quest line it's a little bit of a long quest line that you have to go to multiple locations and Initially, though, he'll tell you that he is going to leave to Batal. Now, he's actually give you a really good starting warrior sword, which you can get called the Life Taker, so you can do this as well. But once he does leave, he'll go to Baron's childhood home in Batal. Now, you'll need to either follow the main quest until you reach a quest called the Feast of Deception, if you want to get into Batal the, like, correct way. There are more unofficial methods that I won't spoil either, but essentially, once you have been able to go there, you'll meet Baron initially in the Border Watch Outpost Training area or sort of around Moonglow Garden or somewhere around there he's often lurking between them or at his childhood home but you can sort of check these locations and then from that point you'll need to do another quest for him or if you're anything like our editor Nick who's getting the footage for this video you'll accidentally decline that next quest from him and he won't give it to you but if you increase your affinity with him with gifts etc he will still actually give you the tome that will unlock the Arc of Might skill which is the maester skill here now this channels every ounce of the user's strength into an almighty blow consuming all of the user's stamina when activated. This skill is good, right? Like it does deal a ton of damage in that blow, but the downside to this is very similar to the archer one in that you lose all of your stamina leaving you vulnerable. It's more punishing here because it is in melee range, whereas the archer, if you do lose all your stamina, you're at least at range, but here you're stuck in the middle of things. So you really need to be selective about using this skill if you do choose to use it. It can absolutely win you fights, you know, if you knock over enemies and deal this almighty blow to them, but it's just something to be cautious of is that stamina management when you're using this skill. For equipment, you've always should be on the hunt for better gear. Now, we did just mention the life taker you can get from Baron, but in the ancient battleground, sort of atop the ancient battlegrounds, there is an ogre here who actually protects a hammer called Black Matter, which is extremely good that you should absolutely go and grab. There is also, if you kill the ogre, you will get a pretty baller like Cyclops helm as well. So you should go there, grab the hammer, and then you've got the ogre as well. Something to consider here, it's exactly the same as the fighter, is that you've got a hammer and a sword, and swords do slash damage and hammers do strike so you could have one of each in your inventory and sort of tinker between them depending on the enemies you're fighting and their resistances but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind if say you're using a strike weapon that you know it won't be as effective on certain enemies same as slash but you've got the option to switch between them for your rings i would probably use the ring that increases your maximum hp and the ring that increases your knockback and stagger on enemies as it's very important for the warrior 
Some tips for the warrior as well. So stamina management we've touched on a little bit here and it is definitely important because of the exact same reason it is with every other class, but it's probably not as difficult to manage your stamina as a warrior than it is with a fighter. Because as a fighter, you're blocking a lot, holding your block and like preventing your stamina regen. Here, you're not doing that as much. It's really just a matter of being able to weave your skills in with regular attacks and barges and doing that little bit of animation canceling and then using chain of blows to then trigger trigger those like faster animation effects as well but you've got a lot of flexibility there if you're creating a character to play as a warrior the bigger the better because carry weight is so important and the weapons and armor of the warrior are so freaking heavy like almost 10 kilos just for a weapon so the more carry weight you have the absolute better this will be for this class you could also and should also run a mage with a warrior for the healing and the weapon imbues and just the general support play because you're going to be in that military range you want someone to sort of keep you alive in that sort of encounter so mages as like your main pawn or a summon pawn can definitely help you with that as well mastering those attack timings is just so important for the warrior right because you attack so slow you hit hard getting stuck in those animations does really suck and the heavy attack can trigger that unique combo that we mentioned and the the warrior ha is one of those classes that has like a really high skill ceiling if you play a lot of the warrior you'll learn those attack animations how to pull off the staggers and the knockbacks and, and like comboing the barge in with your skills and it's one of those classes that you'll probably see clips of online and be like damn like this class looks like a ton of fun it looks like it's really hard but then you'll pick it up and you'll be like really clunky and slow initially because it, it does take a bit to get going you will need to level up the vocation a fair bit unlock those skills to really succeed You unlock the Mystic Spear Hand relatively early in the game, depending on the decisions that you make and, and how fast you progress the main story. But essentially avoiding as many spoilers as possible here, once you arrive at Venworth, you'll need to do some quests for Captain Brant. Once you have done one of these quests, you can then return to Melv. Melv will be under attack and Sigurd will actually be there helping protect the town. Now, after you've done that, you can actually speak to him and he will then just give you the Mystic Spear Hand vocation. Alternatively, if you didn't talk to him here or you can't find him, he actually lives in Half Village. So you can actually go down there and speak to him as well. What's really unique about the Mystic Spear Hand is that it is a hybrid vocation, both in terms of having melee options with the Duo Spear and ranged options with the Redoubted Bolt or Foreboding Bolt with that you charge the R1. And it can do both physical and magic damage. There is a lot of flexibility in terms of those damage types and capabilities of the Spear Hand. The Spear Hand does also have some CC potential as well with redoubted bolt causing the enemy to flinch and then once you charge it by holding the R1 it will become a forbiding bolt which will freeze the target in place preventing its movement and you can actually charge the R1 while you're just attacking normally right just like doing your normal actions you can charge it so you can essentially like lock enemies in place especially the larger enemies by just continually using this and like weaving it into your normal attack pattern preventing them from moving around or say flying off. You can then also combo for Biting Bolt with the magic cut to do sort of like a finishing type attack on smaller enemies. Like when they're locked in that place, you can then use the magic cut and you like stab into them and do this sort of like heavy attack animation that does a bit more damage. Movement is really important for the spear hand, right? You've got your normal square attacks that deal physical damage while your heavy attacks do magic damage with the magic cut. And you can actually weave these two together doing both the twin cuts and the magic cuts as well. And unlike some of the other classes, you will be using these basic mechanics quite a lot as a spearhead, right? From the main flow of combat is using both the light and heavy attacks, weaving them together with the redoubted bolt or the foreboding bolt to deal damage in that way, rather than dumping all your stamina with certain skills like you do with some of the other classes like the mage and the sorcerer, for example. Speaking of those skills, there is definitely a few good options here. The first being Dragoon's Foin, which is a sort of a gap closer primarily like you'll use this to get in close to enemies and you can also do this against flying enemies or larger enemies to get up high as it, it can be used vertically to deal damage in that way and get in close to enemies you can also use this say to climb on top of enemies I've done that a couple of times as well it's definitely a great gap closer and damage dealer to you can get close to enemies now there is actually a skill called quick foint which is an upgrade to foreboding bolt that can actually be a gap closer as well so you can use that in 
instead, but the flexibility that this skill gives you is definitely worth using. Sky Dragoon's Feast, in a similar way, you can consider it as well as this darts you upwards in the air and then you plunge down. You can actually use this to get on top of enemies and other ways as well. It's also good to, you know, slam yourself down on enemies and deal damage in this way, especially from high ground. So a lot of movement capabilities just in those first two skills and a skill that you probably haven't thought about that you really should be using is the Mirage Shield, which erects a magical barrier around yourself and any allies that are close enough. Now, the barrier doesn't last a super long time, but it does nullify all manner of attacks during that duration. This is really good defensive skill for this offensive focused melee class because you will be taking damage as this class, right? Because you're going to be right in the center of combat and being able to prevent damage from coming. Say, if you've got, you know, a big attack coming that you know that there's like, a, you know, one of the big group creatures is building up some attack animation, you know it's going to hurt, you can use this to prevent that damage from actually hitting you. There is also potential in your fourth slot to run one of the range skills like Setching Blade or the Humble Offering. It, in, it's not necessarily a requirement. You could even run like Unto Sky, which launches enemies into the sky, which is like, obviously it's fun, right? These abilities are very cool and cinematic, which makes this class or vocation really enjoyable to play. But the downside to Unto Sky is that you won't actually get any XP from the enemy that you've just yoinked into the air. So you probably won't want to use that too much unless you just like the cool effect of it. What you'll also notice with the skills here is that they are mostly used for either movement or situationally to accommodate certain things like say protection or move enemies around that sort of a thing, right? It's not like there's other classes where you're going to dump all of your stamina into maximum damage dealing spells, but you've got the option there to sort of manipulate the battlefield in that way. Grab all the core skills as you should with all the other vocations. We've already talked on Foreboding Bolt and Quick Foyt. Scattering Bolt, if time correctly can turn your foreboding bolt into an aoe attack which is also not bad and also winding cut is really really good damage dealer which especially on downed enemies if you can hit them in the face with the duo spear because it spins the spear very quickly and can deal damage at quite a fast rate for the augments here all the spear hand augments are fine to absolutely run but you should spend some time leveling some of the other vocations especially as you don't start as a spear hand right say fighters medal for the increased physical defense or the mages apotropism for increased magic defense and the warrior's vitality for increased HP, right? Like any ways that you can improve your overall survivability is good for the spear hand as you will take damage as this class. Like you can avoid damage because you are able to manipulate yourself, like move around very quickly, but it's just good to have that flexibility compared to some of the other classes like the warrior and the fighter, for example, or even the thief that just avoid damage entirely with their swift step. The vocation maester here is Sigurd. We've already touched on him and where you can initially find him, but he will then send you on a bit of a quest if you want to unlock the maester training for him which is a skill called wild fury now this occurs a little bit later in the game you won't get this straight away and it's a little bit spoilery for some of the stuff that i tried to avoid earlier when you unlock it so i'll try to be vague here but essentially from that attack on malv it the dragon that did attack there, he will want to actually go and finish it off. And in order to do this, you'll first need to actually access the Batal area, either via the main quest or sneaking your way in there. At the Dragon's Breath Tower, sort of along the coast of Batal, like southwest-ish, he will actually be located there and help you to take out the lesser dragon that is located there. After you've defeated the dragon, Sigurd should give you the tome for the Maester's skill. But if he doesn't, like he didn't me, you may need to give him a gift. He fell off the tower during the fight, so I don't know if that's related or not, but I revived him and then went back to my camp and then I was able to talk to him. I gave him a gift and then he seemed to like me again and he actually gave me the tome for Wild Fury. Now, Wild Fury unleashes a relentless flurry of slashes and magical attacks with a clone of yourself. This does tremendous amounts of damage and you can spam this just by continually pressing the button to consume all of your stamina. This is like the main damage dealing ability for the spear hand and it really makes the spear hand sing once you have unlocked this before this point you've only got like those moving abilities and everything we've already discussed but this really brings the whole vocation together so i do recommend going to do this as soon as you can that dragon fight can be pretty tough but if you can beat it this will absolutely make your spear hand gameplay just so much better let's talk about equipment quickly now the core part of the spear hands kit being the duo spear they need both strength and magic as they deal both types of damage so upgrading your weapons in venworth is probably the 
the better option here because it does upgrade both strength and magic sort of evenly, even if it's not particularly leading either way. The Infernal Edge is an amazing fire imbued spear you can get from the Ancient Battleground. This comes from a quest called Tolls of Rest, which you will run into a gentleman sort of on the way to the Ancient Battleground and you'll need to find him and then he'll you'll save him in combat and then he'll ask you to follow him the rest of the way. He'll lead you deep into the Ancient Battleground and you'll complete his quest there and he'll give you a key to the door that is just outside the room that this finishes in. If you can't find him or say you started this quest and then you, he ran off or something, chances are he's probably dead, which is what happened for Nick here because that whole area is just littered with en enemies and he'll just be standing there waiting for you to show up. So he may have actually died. He actually died for me even after the quest, which you can see the footage of here. So it's just a thing to point that you may need to go check the morgue if you can't find this NPC as he's probably dead. The vendor at the checkpoint rest town also sells some quality armor for the spear hand that you can grab early. Upgrading your armor is important as a spear hand because you are going to be in melee range. So having that flexibility is definitely important. For your rings, you can really run anything you want, but the Ring of Skullduggery can be good to increase your damage dealt when attacking enemies from behind, because for the most part, you can do this because you can move yourself around the battlefield very quickly, similar to the Thief. This can be a really valuable ring for a Spearhand player. Some quick tips for the Mystic Spearhand. In terms of pawns and what you should run, you obviously want a mage for healing, and then otherwise, it's kind of up to you. Like fighters or warriors to take some of that brunt of damage coming towards you can be valuable but because you're you've got a lot of movement and flexibility with the spear hand in terms of like range and melee and CC and a bit of protection as well, you can sort of run anything you like. Like I don't think there's any necessary like perfect synergies or requirements that you have to run with a mystic spear hand like some of the other classes. Now holding the redowning bolt does prevent stamina regen. So just be careful of managing your stamina in that way. But learning how to master the mystic spear hand's movement capabilities as well as the timing of the foreboding bolt will Will definitely level up your gameplay as this vocation as it's a little harder than some of the other vocations but there is a lot of freedom in terms of how you want to attack and deal with situations that I think if you get like used to the timings of these different attacks and being able to weave things together and use the different types of bolts then you'll really have a lot of success with the mystic spear hand. So how you unlock the trickster is you'll need to talk to the specter form of Luz at the Reverend Shrine in Batal. It is pretty much south of Checkpoint Rest Town. You will obviously need to have gotten into Batal in order to go here. But once you've gone there, there's no other requirement. You just need to rock up at this place. She'll talk to you and give you the vocation. So how you play as the trickster, I'm going to be honest. I was not a fan of the trickster initially. I did not find it fun when you like you're kind of just doing nothing <laughs> like at the start of combat because the main crux of the trickster right is that you don't deal damage you manipulate enemies to either attack each other attack your illusion or just you know like move them around throw them off cliffs all that good stuff right and in the early stages when you don't have a lot of skills and anything really equipped that like soft aggro abilities like the begolding fumes and and your uh, simulcrum or we'll call it an illusion from now on because simulcrum is just a big word and it's too big for my tiny brain but like your illusion is like it's just not a lot to it you don't really do anything you just sort of summon it and then you make your enemies attack it and then you just kind of stand there and that does change a little bit as you get a little bit further on with this vocation but it's definitely not my favorite but I'm going to tell you exactly how to play it if it is your favorite and I'm sorry to shit on your vacation if you do love this. All right, so Beguiling Fumes is like your basic attack, which is like your soft aggro taunt. And if you hold this down, once you've got the core skill, you can then actually use it as a bit of a long range. You barely will use this as you can use the Suffocating Shroud to essentially taunt everything around you, especially once you've upgraded it. Pretty much everything will automatically attack your illusion once you have got Suffocating Shroud. So you'll barely ever use this skill really just to top up the aggro on a couple of targets here and there. The Effigial Essence is your triumph which summons the simulcrum to you and what this will do is it will summon it and then if you have it active it'll change their ephragal snuff which will end the illusion you never want to end the illusion you always want to keep it active because if you end it all that aggro from the enemies will immediately come to you now when this is summoned it'll summon right in front of you and you can press r1 evoking essence to then have the illusion follow you this will allow you to place it exactly where you want it to be like say for example if you're using a sorcerer right that is using 
using AoE spells, you can place it right in the center of their AoE spells to make sure that your enemies are actually hitting it. Ideally, that is the case, right? You want to put this somewhere that's out in the open so your pawns can actually dump all their damage into the enemies while they're attacking the illusion. You can then summon it back to you with the R1 Evoking Essence. If you need to heal it up, as once you've unlocked the core skill Mending Vapor, it'll heal once you've actually got it onto you, then you can put it back where you want it. There are other ways to like place it out and move it around and stuff as well, which we'll cover in the skills. But essentially the crux of the vocation is making all the enemies taunt onto your illusion and then buffing your allies, manipulating everything to really like you're sort of sitting in the background, like, you know, playing chess with the enemies and your pawns really, right? You're not really going to be damaging enemies as your actual main weapon doesn't actually do any damage. Just with a tiny little bit if you like smack enemies in the face with it, like say if you've knocked down a large enemy or something. But for the most part, you will never be doing damage with this, this vocation. So let's get into those skills, right? Suffocating Shroud, we mentioned now, this summons like a diffusing smoke in a very broad range, attracting the attention of all the targets. Once you've upgraded this, it is the core of the Trickster's kit. You will use this skill constantly to make sure that everything is attacking your illusion. It's like you you will just use this all the time, right? You'll never replace this skill. The other like core skill here is really going to be the Aromatic Resurgence, which essentially buffs all of your pawns of their offensive capabilities. Now, this is great because your pawns are going to be doing all of the damage, literally all of it. So you want to buff them as much as possible and this allows you to do it. So essentially, most combat encounters, you'll be using Suffocating Shroud to taunt all the enemies onto your illusion and then immediately follow up with aromatic resurgence to buff all your pawns damage so they can hit them. The third skill I would constantly run is the latching effigy. Now this launches the illusion up to a target and it will hit them and possess them and force all the other enemies to attack that target. The only downside is the target that it's latched to will still be aggroed to you. So just be mindful of that, but it will often be like staggered and flinching because like so many enemies are often attacking them, right? It's definitely a must have, especially to put this on like, let's say for example, if you're fighting, you know, an ogre or a large creature and you've got a bunch of like goblin stuff around you, put the latch latching onto the boss, right? And then they all attack the boss, right? Works out perfectly. Your last skill is a little like personal preference, I would say, and you've got a few options. Delusionary screen summons an illusionary wall that hinders the hostile target's movement and blocks their field of vision. I like to use this, especially in caves, to block the vision to like my casters. So my mage and sorcerer can safely deal damage without having to worry about enemies attacking them. Fickle floor is essentially the same, except it's a platform that you put on the ground. Now you can put this over an edge and have enemies jump off it. Even you can put this on the ground and they'll often like trip over it because they're expecting there to be like a jump there. So they'll still fall down. I sort of prefer the wall here as I feel like it's better value, but you can definitely use this to have enemies jump off cliffs, that sort of thing. Espial Essence detaches the caster spirit from their physical form, allowing you to move this spirit around anywhere as long as you have stamina. And while you can do that, you can actually summon your illusion to follow you and move it into specific locations, say off ledges. So then you can have enemies like jump off ledges or move in that way. You can absolutely use this skill as well. It's a good way to like scout ahead too. Like say, if you want to know what's around each corner, that sort of a thing. But you can really pick between these. It's entirely up to you. I think those first three are absolutely mandatory and then you've got a bit of freedom there. The core skills, we already mentioned Mending Vapor about why that's great to heal up your illusion, which you absolutely should be doing. You never want it to go down. The trailing aroma extends the distance you can actually get from your illusion. This is pretty valuable because without this, it, the distance isn't that great. You do have to stay pretty close. The further you are away from it, you know, the better because then you're not really in any danger of being hit. What I often do like out of combat is I'll just like hold R1 while it's active and it'll literally just follow you indefinitely and then you don't have to resummon it at the start of every combat encounter. For your augments, they're all pretty solid here. You want to grab them, obviously. The detection one is really good. Like this alerts you to the presence of seeker tokens and waste stones. I am legitimately shocked how many seeker tokens there are. Like they are everywhere. Like locations that I've been to before, I'm finding just so many seeker tokens. They are everywhere. So I recommend to have this augment active on all your vocations if you are chasing seeker tokens. The magic archer has some great augments for the trickster that buff your pawns, like sustainment to augment the physical defense and magic defense of your pawns and ascendancy to increase their strength and magic, obviously their offensive capabilities, which are both fantastic. So you can obviously grab those. Provocation from the fighter line isn't bad either because then you, you know, have enemies attacking you, which is sort of the main focus here. Like you are kind of like a tank, but not really. The vocation maester is Luz that we did touch on before. Now she is actually at the reverent shrine, her physical form. Now you can get the maester skill when you go there to actually get the trickster 
vocation as well. At the back of like the shrine that she's at, there is a ladder that allows you to climb to the roof. Now, once you're up here, you'll need to move around to the very front. And she's just like sitting on a ledge there. You just need to talk to her and she'll be like, oh, you found me. And then she'll give you the dragon's delusion, which creates an illusionary dragon that can't deal damage, but it fears hostiles, makes them trip and flee and that sort of thing. This is pretty solid as... For the most part, it will prevent enemies from attacking once this has gone off for maybe like five to 10 seconds, right? They will either run away or they'll just like stand there in shock of like the fear, right? And it just prevents them from attacking, which is good. Now, it's it's suffers from the same criticisms as the rest of the trickster kit in that you aren't dealing damage directly. And in some cases, you don't necessarily want the enemies to like flee and scatter, right? You want them to be targeting your illusion and grouped up together so you can dump damage into them. Whereas if they stagger and spread out it makes it a little bit harder for your pawns to like path over there and attack them so i don't really like it that much but it does have its uses equipment for the trickster here it doesn't kind of matter that much because you're not really going to be taking any damage directly because you've got the illusion that's doing that for you and you're not really going to be dishing out damage yourself because you don't really do that but something to note is that the strength and magic stats on your weapon isn't actually used for damage necessarily right what it actually used for is for strength it increases the effect of the like taunt from your your attacks that you do do as well as the magic stat which increases the health of your illusions so there is benefits to this right like in upgrading your gear but it's less beneficial than some of the other classes right like you can probably get away with just the vermidian style upgrades or even the elven right to increase the magic to increase the hp of your illusion for the rings you can honestly wear whatever i've been wearing the ring that reduces the knockback and stagger because you know i obviously don't want that to happen when i'm trying to get these effects off to stop enemies from attacking me a couple of tips for the vocation you probably want a mostly ranged party it does get a little bit messy when you've got melee characters i found because they pull the aggro off your illusion and they move the enemies around around too much that it's kind of tricky now the the trickster is essentially a tank right like the illusion is tanking for you and having a fighter or a warrior even a thief to some regard that are manipulating enemies and taking away that aggro it can get a little bit tricky so i've often just gone with a mage sorcerer and ranger for my pawn party here and then i essentially go into the melee range set up my like illusions and set up the whole kit and then i often make sure that i've set up the illusion in the center of like my sorcerer's aoe spells so that all the enemies are like in them especially that blizzard aoe that like freezes enemies as well like great value out of that and make sure your mage has high palladium as well now what this does is it'll add like a little bubble on you and if you like an enemy tries to attack you it'll absorb that entire hit really valuable because as soon as you get hit your illusion will disappear right now this allows you to have a bit of like flexibility if you do take a little bit of damage if one enemy gets away from you it won't matter because it'll take that hit you won't lose your illusion and you can then redirect that enemy back to the illusion like you wanted to actually go to so how you unlock the magic archer you'll get it from an elf down in the volcanic island now you'll initially run into her husband as soon as you reach the volcanic island if you go down the south route of batal all the way down the bottom there's a cave you need to go through to actually get here the dwarf will be on the main road he'll give you a quest and essentially you just need to follow his quest line all the way to the very end at the volcanic island camp and his wife will then give you the magic archer vocation and at the same time she should give you the mace to skill if she doesn't you may need to like give her some gifts or just like follow her around until she talks to you and gives it to you but she should give you the mace skill at the same time so the magic archer as a vocation can be played in a couple of ways you've got both offensive skills and really support healing skills that you can use this and the quality of its basic attack gives you so much flexibility in combat to really succeed in multitude of ways now that basic attack is either pinpoint valley as a one wide range attacks you can target like uh, more enemies at a wider radius or rivet shot which is a tighter radius and locks on a little bit faster but it's harder to target multiple enemies personally i would just use rivet shot as it is like the most powerful seemingly and it locks on faster which is the main focus here and you can still hit multiple targets if that's your aim but for the most part here you don't really need to as it does just shred through enemies on its own it's probably one of the best basic attacks in the game and because once you've upgraded it with tracker's 
sight you can then hit even more arrows that go out all at once and they always heat seek as well which is part of the reason why it's so good is that you can heat seek these onto the weak points onto enemies right so you're always hitting weak point with all of these arrows all at once it has great burst potential because of that the play style otherwise is very similar to just the standard archer right like you'll be in the back line more or less you'll be throwing out arrows to either heal or damage enemies with a various amount of elemental types which you can then imbue with your bow to deal those elemental damages as well so lots of flexibility here and not a whole lot to manage in terms of stamina management as you will be using rivet shot a whole lot and then using your skills supplementary but your skills are actually quite quality here and speaking of those skills let's cover the main ones that you want to use sagittate avalanche conjures and fires a multitude of magical arrows that can be focused on a single target or a single point this is like kind of like a souped up version of your basic attack right like it has really great burst damage especially once you charge it all the way to maximize the amount of arrows that goes out i really like this to burst down targets on their weak points arctic bolt fires a giant clump of ice now you want to hold this so the ice gets fully charged so then it's a higher like like larger piece of ice this is a massive stagger which when fully charged will almost knock over any large enemy that is off balance or it will at least put them off balance if they aren't actually off balance yet really good damage potential as well if you hit weak points can really do more damage than i was expecting it to do considering the huge amount of stagger that it actually does i also tinkered with a lot of the other damage spells but they feel a bit more situational and probably a little more personal preference right like ricochet seeker launches a bunch of magical arrows in the air depending on how long you hold it for really good in caves because they all ricochet off like all the cave walls it does heaps of damage here but outside of caves it's kind of average flame fang arrow will charge a magical flame arrow that will explode on impact this is cool because you can like control the arrows trajectory and like make it land exactly where you want but it does slow down the pace of this class because you've got to wait for that arrow to land right like the whole time you're in that animation like aiming the arrow before it lands you're not actually doing anything else and there's sort of other options you can be doing sedative bolt will put targets to sleep especially if you hold it to charge it for longer like you may as well just kill the target honestly like like for the most part the candescent orb actually do like this fires an orb of searing flame that illuminates the area and causes targets to catch flame now we can stick to targets as well like if you hit them with it it'll like track them around but once it sets them on fire it does like that damage over time effect and you can definitely run this as like a set and forget like you can sort of like throw this at the start of combat make sure it hits them hopefully it sets them on fire and then you can deal the other damage types you could then also rather than running a damage slot for the other skills run some of the really good support skills i do like life taker arrow which loses an arrow hex with magic that saps the health of hostile targets in a line of fire and grants it to allied pawn so it's a heal that also damages enemies and you could run a bartizan which is a barrier on allies that blocks incoming damage and dealing damage back to the attacker when it hits them so both really good options but a lot of personal preference in those other couple of skills the other skill that you absolutely have to run is the ultimate skill martyr's bolt which fires an ultimate magical bolt in exchange for a temporary decrease to your max health so you will lose max health while this is charging like the loss gauge goes down but the amount of damage that this does is absolutely obscene and you really should be running this if you are playing the magic archer right you need to be careful about your usage this isn't like a ultimate skill that you can just spam as much as you like because it takes down your maximum amount of health until you do like have an actual rest at a camp or an inn etc but the amount of damage it can do especially on knockdown targets is absolutely insane and it's both aoe like really good in group scenarios or individual like funny little story here i was doing a side quest where i needed to help this individual like view a griffin and like they wanted me to extend the fight as long as possible because they were like you know wanted to observe the griffin right and i was like cool no worries and i just like put the skill on my bar and i was like oh i'll give it a crack and it just like wiped the griffin immediately <laughs> like so it's it's really good it's an incredible skill that i highly do recommend using the core skills here you obviously want to get them all a couple of ones to make note of is protracting arrow so anytime you use one of these weapon skills that have elemental effects like fire ice and lightning it'll then imbue your normal attacks with that element for a period of time so think about that when you're say hitting enemies with weaknesses use that arrow type and then use your basic arrows because it'll be imbued 
reviewed with that as well. Tracker Sight, absolute must, increases the maximum amount of lock on targets with pinpoint volley or rivet shot. So the more arrows it'll fire, obviously the more damage. The augments for the Magic Archer are probably better from some of the other vocations, but you still have a few good options here. Veracity gives you a little bit of stamina when you deliver the killing blow to a target. Sustainment and Ascendancy increase your pawns, defense and magic defense and strength and magic. So also good options here, like if you do want to buff your pawns in that way. But I also like the Thief's Subtlety to reduce your chance of being attacked by foes. Archer's Lethality increases the damage dealt when striking a target's vitals, which you should be doing, right? Because you can lock onto the weak points. And the Sorcerer actually has some really good augments for this because of all the different elemental damage types we're doing, the debilitations, like, you know, setting enemies on fire, etc. that we can do. So you've got like Asperity to increase the likelihood of inflicting debilitations on your targets. Catalyst to increase the damage dealt when exploiting a target's elemental weakness. So let's talk about some equipment here. Now, after you have done the quest to unlock the magic archer, you should go back to that dwarf's home as he does become a blacksmith and a vendor and he sells the dragon breath magic bow, which is one of the best in the game. And definitely you want to just grab this bow because of its insane amount of damage potential. So you can then use that. Now, armor wise, you can kind of just wear whatever here. Like you want to upgrade your bow at the armor blacksmith for the extra magic. You can even use that dwarven blacksmith just to get the extra knockback if you are leaning into like arctic bolt for example but really the extra magic is really important here for the bow because you are primarily going to be using the magic for all these magical arrows and conversely here for the ring right getting the ring that increases your magic even further is definitely valuable a couple of tips for the magic archer you need at least one melee fighter or warrior to protect you in combat so you want them to be attacking that character and you know you can use the to me command if you are being pressured to have your pawns come and protect you if enemies are actually attacking you you obviously don't want to be attacked directly you want to be sitting in the back line really dishing out damage in that way but because of the sheer amount of damage you do do you can often actually pull the aggro off your melee characters so just be mindful of that if you are struggling with that then having maybe two like a fighter and a warrior that both have the taunts might help you in some of those scenarios as well but there's not much else really to say about the magic archer right the basic attack is incredible it has really good skills both support and damage it's a fantastic vocation that i do highly recommend you guys checking out so how to unlock the warfarer you will need to talk to lamond in the volcanic island camp but he is up the top in the hot springs area now by speaking to him he will give you a quest and what you'll need to bring him is newt liquor now you can get newt liquor in the higgs tavern stand at back batal now here what you'll need to do is like grab a bag and put it into the fenced area which will then trigger a cutscene, which will then put you into the upstairs section of the tavern which will allow you to buy newt liquor for five thousand gold each you'll need to buy three of these and bring him all three you could buy two and then just grab the one that is actually at the dwarf's house in the volcanic island camp but either way you've got to give him three and then he will complete the quest and he'll give you the warfare of vocation now at the same time he should give you the grandmaster's path so you can unlock rearmament which is the maester skill and like the core like skill for the warfarer so make sure he does give it to you and you might need to like linger so that he talks to you again and then gives it to you but just make sure you get the skill from him all right so the vocation itself is really interesting now essentially here you can equip every single weapon from all the other vocations and use all of their skills except for their maester skill so you can't use the maester skill here which is the trade-off now one thing to note as well is that the weight of the first weapon will be the only only one that actually counts towards your carry weight so you can carry nine weapons without being you know heavily encumbered so really what you've got to decide is which vocations that you are going to use and that's a tough decision because i mean they're all relatively good now one thing to consider here is that you need vocations that have a really good basic attack or that really excel with only one or two skills because you are going to be limited to three skills total if you're going to use that fourth slot for rearmament so you can switch weapons now you don't have to do that right like you can just run four skills and actually manually change your weapons in your equipment inventory by unequipping whatever you've got equipped and equipping another one but that's just complicated so 
think about the vocations that you personally connect with that you enjoy that maybe have like one or two skills that you really like a really good example for me personally is the magic archer i love the magic archer's basic attack here it's also one of the best in the game right it auto targets you can hit weak points it does a ton of damage plus like when you buff it with all the core skills from the vocation line it's really good so magic archer is a great ranged options to connect with and then figuring out what else you want to use it with because there isn't really much point in just having one vocation equipped right unless you just want to go you know full fashions dogma so you can wear like any armor but really like you've got to figure out what you want to use now i'll give you some build examples in a little bit we're just going to cover a bit more about the vocation itself so there is definitely a balance to the amount of weapons you should be using right because theoretically you can equip them all but you don't want to be switching between them to find the exact one you're looking for or the one weapon you have a skill equipped for right so just think about that balance of how many you're using now another thing to note is that the core skills are only active when you have the corresponding weapon active for that vocation the best example of this is right for like the mage or the sorcerer you have to have a staff equipped if you want to actually be able to use levitate and on that same note having a mage staff equipped at most times is not a bad idea so you can use the triangle heal ability if you do need a little bit of extra healing and when you have a weapon active like a vocation active your stats will actually change to match that specific vocation now it won't be min maxed or to the perfect degree that the other actual vocation is like using the magic archer here as an example you can see that my magic stat is actually less when i'm a warfare compared to when i'm actually a magic archer even though it like took my armor off because you know i can't wear that armor as a magic archer but you can see there that the stats are actually different so that's part of the trade-off here is that you lose access to the maester skills for the vocations you lose access to like essentially having like perfect or like close to perfect like stats right but the benefits here is that you can switch weapons of any of the weapons you can use any of the skills that aren't the master skills and you've got that flexibility and you can sort of think about how you can combo the different vocations together right so for the best skills and augments here I mean, there isn't really any because the Warfare doesn't have its own skills. It's just rearmament that you can do. Now, if you are using rearmament, make sure that you're setting the equipped order correctly. That's something that you pref like, like in the order that makes sense to you, right? Like, let's say if you start combat using one specific skill all the time, make sure that that one's like at the start of the order. So, you know, sort of, and then you can like flow into the other ones. For augments, you do get two here that are exclusive to the Warfare. You get zeal, which reduces the stamina consumed when performing a weapon skill and dynamism, which reduces the amount by which weight affects your movement speed both are pretty solid and you could definitely run both but your other augments are really dependent on the build you're running so let's give you some build combos to try. Let's start with a ranged combo being the Sorcerer and the Magic Archer. Now the Sorcerer has some insane damage spells, but a pretty average and weak basic attack, which we're alleviating by using the Magic Archer for our basic attack. So essentially the combo here is using the Sorcerer to use like Hargle for the Blizzard and the Prisian Flare, which you can then hit that Flare with the Magic Archer's basic attack to deal just incredible amounts of damage. The Magic Archer also has some great support and dagger capabilities if you wanted to put that on the third skill slot there but mainly you're using the magic archer for the basic attack here because of its high amount of damage potential that you can do from that this is definitely one of the most powerful combinations that I have found of the different combinations that I have tried. And it's really simple to get the benefits of, right? Just by hitting flare and then switching to the magic archer and then hitting that flare with your basic attacks. And then you've got the flexibility to switch between the two. And they both have really good synergies between these two being both magic classes and, and just the way that they can lean in each other's weaknesses and strengths. The second is one that I really thought was going to work and it, it just... It doesn't work that great and I was kind of disappointed about it, but I wanted to tell you about it anyway. So I tried the Trickster and the Mystic Spear Hand because, you know, the Trickster's weakness, right, is that they can't attack, but they can taunt with their like little illusion that you can have there. So I thought, well, what if I make some sort of a tanking thing with the Trickster, you know, having everything attack the illusion, then I switch to the Mystic Spear Hand and just like clean up. But the issue here is that the Trickster's illusion, when you don't have the Trickster as your active vocation, it just like disappears is almost instantly which kind of sucks i don't know why that happens like uh, you know i hope if the devs actually change that because then it makes like no sense for using the trickster with the warfare at all if your illusion just completely disappears right so i tried that combo it didn't particularly work but it was something fun that i thought i'd mention to you guys anyway now the third combo is just like what i've essentially been running because i think if you're running the warfare you should be playing something that is fun to you right comboing your favorite vocations and your favorite skills to just have fun because 
To be honest, the game isn't really that hard. Like you don't necessarily need to have the most bombastic build ever. For me personally, my favorite vocations are the Magic Archer, which I've talked about in that video, and the Mystic Spearhand, which I talked about in that guide as well. And so I'm using these together to then combo their skills that I like, especially like the Mirror Shield for the Spearhand so I can avoid taking damage. And then I can stand there as the Magic Archer and deal massive stagger with Arctic Shock and knock enemies down and then go into melee range and follow up with the Mystic Spearhand. I really like the combo of these two and it gives me both ranged and melee flexibility. And it's just my favorite two vocations. So that's sort of why I've gone that route. But, you know, and, but that's kind of what I wanted to highlight here, right? Is that you can make anything you want that is fun for you to play and there's some, a couple of examples that I have done but I'd love to know what you have tried in the comments down below and things that work like you know there's obvious ones right like the thief for example is obviously going to be great in any sort of these builds so let me know what builds you're running in the comments below but let's talk about some equipment and then some tips so literally any armor you can wear right like anything that's cool to you you can honestly put on because the warfare has access to literally everything so it's all about the fashion here to be honest now when when you're upgrading your armor do recommend probably the dwarven style because of the knockdown resistance here plus it upgrades everything evenly same goes for like your weapons and your rings really like your rings are dependent on whatever build you're running right if you're running like a magic build like the sorcerer magic archer then having a ring that boosts your magic isn't bad and for the weapons you want to upgrade them at basically wherever makes sense for that weapon some tips for playing the warfarer now with all of my other vocation guides that we have put out all the best skills and augments and tips and everything they're all relevant here for the warfare right like if you're playing as that vocation as the warfare it's absolutely still relevant here now I, as i mentioned like i highly recommend to experiment find your own combos use skills that you like and figure out what's fun for you now you can unequip the skill that switches the weapons like i mentioned earlier rearmament and then instead just like manually switch them in your inventory this gives you an extra skill slot if you want to then run four skills and you can actually switch your skills at the campsite which isn't super relevant for most of the other vocations but it is for the warfare here right like say if you want to switch up your build, like you find a weapon or you just want to change up the skills you're using because at the campsite, you can't change your vocation, but you can change your skills and you've got access to basically every skill. You can then just quickly change it on the fly at any campsite. And then fun fact, I guess, for the vocation as well is that when you are a warfarer, it will rank up all of your other vocations even if it's not the vocation you have equipped. So it won't get like heaps of actual like points, but all the vocations will actually get some points and you'll actually see often when you level up as a warfarer, it'll level up one of your other vocations as well, which is really cool. But thank you guys for watching this video till the end. Thank you to our members for supporting the channel. My name is Norza and I hope you have a great day.